This video has been sponsored by Squarespace. Tolkien really liked writing, obviously, but more specifically, he really loved creating. Be that languages, characters, worlds, myths. For Tolkien, the act of creating was both spiritually and emotionally fulfilling, and his ideas about human creativity and its connection to philosophy and theology get at the very heart of the messaging of The Lord of the Rings. We can see this theme coming through as early as the beginning, the very beginning. Before there was anything, before there was Middle Earth or even the concept of physical existence itself, Eru Iluvatar, the One God, created the Ainur, a retinue of spiritual beings that surrounded him in the emptiness of the void. The Ainur ranged in power and personality and ability, but the most powerful and the most wise amongst them was named Melkor. He knew the mind of Iluvatar better than any of the other Ainu. He was the wisest and the strongest, but because of that, he grew restless. And if you have been left feeling restless, thinking about how lacking your online presence is, boy are you in luck because this video has been sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website building platform that's gonna help you stand out and succeed online. Their next generation Fluid Engine allows you to use drag and drop technology to simplify the website making process from both desktop and mobile. It's going to be easier than ever for you to unlock your creativity. And if you want to display some of your creative work, Squarespace allows you to organize your video library and showcase your content however you want to. And if you'd like, you can also put those videos behind a paywall, all through Squarespace. And it is so easy to see how all of this is going using their inbuilt analytics. They'll help you up your engagement by giving you insight on your top traffic sources and your sale metrics. If you want to give your creativity a platform or take your existing brand to the next level, you should check out Squarespace. Just go to squarespace.com for a totally free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Jess of the Shire to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel, and thanks to all of you for checking out my sponsors. In the beginning, before there was Arda, there was nothing. There was only the emptiness of the void, and Melkor, filled to the brim with the spirit of his own maker, was desperate to fill that void. And before long, it would seem that that wish was going to be fulfilled. Iluvatar began the Song of the Ainur, a piece of collective music sung by all of the voices of the Ainur which would bring creation into being. But as that song progressed, branching off of the original theme intoned by Iluvatar in numerous beautiful ways, Melkor's dissatisfaction only grew. As the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor to interweave matters of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Iluvatar, for he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. He had gone often alone into the void places, seeking the imperishable flame, for desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own, and it seemed to him that Iluvatar took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. Melkor began singing his own theme, one at odds with the song of Iluvatar, and immediately discord arose. There could not be two creators conducting one song. Melkor could not be the creator that Iluvatar had been. While Melkor had been made in the image of Iluvatar, the imperishable flame, the true spark of life, was not his to wield. It was Iluvatar's alone. Thus, Melkor's new tune was brash and hollow, at odds with the full beauty of the tune of Iluvatar, and it caused only discord and disruption. But soon, even this discord was resolved into harmony. The song of Iluvatar encased Melkor's melody. It worked with it. It created something even more powerful, even more beautiful than it had been when it began. 
Although many of the Ainur were swayed to Melkor's side during the song, singing along with one solid voice his melody, in the end, they were all once again singing in the song of Iluvatar. When the song had ended, Iluvatar spoke. And thou, Melkor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. For a time after this, Melkor held his tongue. He played the part of the happy I knew going down into creation when it had burst forth from that original song, but his discord was woven deeply into the tapestry of time and space. He would never let go of his role as the slighted would-be maker. But he now knew that, at least according to Iluvatar's proclamation, he would never have the flame imperishable. It was impossible for him to create something that was entirely new. Anything that he did make would be Iluvatar's because he was Iluvatar's creation. And with this in mind, he decided that if he could not create, he would destroy. He wanted to eradicate all that was not independently created by him, and when these efforts were thwarted by the Valar, he decided to simply twist and ruin and corrupt everything else. He became known as Morgoth, the Dark Enemy, and he would spread ruination, corruption, and death all throughout Arda. Eventually, he was defeated and imprisoned beyond the walls of the world, forced to stare out forever helpless at the empty void that had first tempted him away from the light. Morgoth is, if we are to view this through Tolkien's Catholic lens, effectively Satan. He is the big bad, the first to fall, the once closest to God and now self-banished the furthest away from him. And it is no small matter that Tolkien made the root of his sin, the root of his dissatisfaction, creation. It is this complex and often fraught relationship between the creator and the created thing that is the root of all evil in Middle-earth. But this problem of creation manifests differently for everyone, including the other big bad of the series, Sauron. Sauron was not always evil. He was one of the Ainur, one of those first spirits created, a lesser powerful Maya, but he trained under the Valar, Aule. We'll get to talking more about Aule later, but from him, Sauron learned a great deal about blacksmithing and building and crafting. No doubt, this was one of the things that swayed him to Morgoth's side. They both had a desire to create to realize their imaginations in reality. But Sauron was not like Morgoth. He was clever, and he watched Morgoth's ruination, his defeat from afar, and decided that he would do better. Sauron had never reached this stage of nihilistic madness. He did not object to the existence of the world, so long as he could do what he liked with it. He still had relics of positive purposes that descended from the good of the nature in which he began. It had been his virtue, and therefore also the cause of his fall and his relapse, that he loved order and coordination, and disliked all confusion and wasteful friction. Sauron knew that he could not usurp Iluvatar. He could not take his place but he could work much more insidiously. He could take, he could corrupt, he could control all of these things, even if they were not his. He could not have the flame imperishable. He could not have the spark of life. He could not create new life, but he could own these things that were not his. This is his passion. It's the thing that drove him forward. It was what led him to believe that he should pour all of his malice and his cruelty and his will to dominate all life into one ring, one overpowering, controlling ring. But in the end, that ring would be his downfall. He isn't God. And in the end, when the ring leads to his destruction, his armies, his plans, his schemes all scatter without him at the helm. 
throughout the story, from the Silmarillion all the way up to the Lord of the Rings and beyond, we see over and over again creative ambition being the downfall of brilliant souls. The dwarves delve too deep, too greedily, Feanor crafts the beautiful Silmaril gems which cause centuries of strife, and Celebrimbor is convinced by Anatar to create the Rings of Power. Creating is dangerous, and there are plenty of warnings in The Lord of the Rings about what might happen if you become too eager, if you become a little bit too full of yourself about it. But not all of Tolkien's creative characters are doomed to failure. There is at least one who manages to get it right. Aule is one of the Valar, the same class of characters as Morgoth, although he's not quite as powerful as Morgoth. And while some of the Valar were given governance over the sea, or the skies, or plants, Aule was given governance over crafting over the smithing and the shaping of physical materials. He forged the lamps that became the sun and the moon, he created the iron shackles that would bind Morgoth, but his most important creation was not one of iron, but of flesh. In the secrecy of his forges, before any sentient beings walked Middle-earth, Aule used the visions that he had been given of the elves and men that were to come and created his own creatures based off of that design. They were short and stout, and maybe had some pretty big beards, and just like him, they were deeply invested in physical objects, in crafting and shaping beautiful things. But, as marvelous as these creatures were, for Aule this was an overstep, and Iluvatar soon confronted him. Why hast thou done this? Why dost thou attempt a thing which thou knowest is beyond thy power and thy authority? Then Aule answered, I desired things other than I am, to love and to teach them, so that they too might perceive the beauty of Ea which thou hast caused to be. For it seemed to me that there is great room in Arda for many things that might rejoice in it. Yet it is for the most part empty still and dumb and in my impatience, I have fallen into folly." Tolkien explains that in thought and in desire, Aule is the most like Morgoth, and it's not hard to see why. In both of them, there's this impatience with nothingness. They see the void before them, and they know how many beautiful, marvelous things they could possibly put into it. Because of this desire, both Morgoth and Aule do things that they are not supposed to do. Things that are not their right to do. But Aule, unlike Morgoth, is willing to repent. He's willing to recognize his folly. Yet the making of things is in my heart from my own making by thee. And the child of little understanding that makes play of the deeds of his father may do so without thought of mockery, but because he is the son of his father. But what shall I do now, so that thou be not angry with me forever? As a child to his father, I offer to thee these things, the work of the hands which thou hast made, do with them what thou wilt. But should I not rather destroy the work of my presumption? Then Aule took up a great hammer to smite the dwarves, and he wept. But Iluvatar, had compassion upon Aule and his desire because of his humility, and the dwarves shrank from the hammer and were afraid, and they bowed down their heads and begged for mercy. Everyone in Arda, from Aule to Morgoth to Sauron, has an inbuilt desire to be a maker. They were made in the image of Iluvatar, and so it is in their very blood, bound up within the nature of their souls. But what really counts is what they do with that desire. The rightly ordered maker understands their place. They don't try to create new life. They don't try to assume control over things that are not theirs. And if they do make a mistake, if they do overstep, as we all do sometimes, they know well enough to repent, to surrender their creations to the ultimate creator, and if that is not satisfactory, to destroy them utterly. 
Aule is one of these rightly ordered makers, and it is his surrender to Iluvatar's will that sets him apart from characters like Morgoth. And it is because of this humility that Iluvatar halts Aule's hammer and spares the dwarves, taking them under his wing and burying them in the bowels of the earth until it is their time to wake. Aule rejoices, saying, May Eru bless my work and amend it. Someone like Morgoth, with all of his pride and self-importance, would never be willing to bow his head and admit that he needs his work to be blessed and amended by Iluvatar. Sauron would not have accepted something being granted free will beyond his own will. Although Aule sinned, he repented, and it is this rightly ordered relationship between the creation and creator that Tolkien was so enraptured with. In his writings about writing, especially on fairy story, Tolkien describes the writer of fantasy fiction as a sub-creator. As an author, you take a role that's sort of similar to that of God, the maker. You take the threads of imagination, creativity, and wonder, and use them to spark something out of nothing. In a way, you bring a new universe into being every time you enter story. But the most thing to remember in the term sub-creator is the prefix. The sub. That is what divides your Aules from your Morgoths. It's this willing recognition that as a fantasy writer, you are not working as God, but under God. And while some might see that as a limitation, like an ankle weight, Tolkien saw it as the most profound joy possible. He wrote his fantasy fiction out of a desire to find the truth. And that might be a little bit, you know, silly, since he was writing fantasy fiction, which isn't technically true. But in reality, we have been using unreal things to get down to the real heart of the human experience since we've been human. Stories are what drew us together in the first place. They were how we contextualized each other, how we made sense of the world around us, whether or not they were strictly, like, scientifically true. Tolkien explains, Fantasy is a natural human activity. It certainly does not destroy or even insult reason, and it does not either blunt the appetite for nor obscure the perception of scientific verity. On the contrary, the keener and the clearer is the reason, the better fantasy it will make. Creating fantasy fiction was, to Tolkien, a love letter to God and all of the profound beauty of creation. Tolkien discovered how amazing our lands and seas were by creating his own. He discovered the enchantment of language and communication by creating his own languages. He learned what it meant to be human by creating inhuman characters. He learned who his creator was by creating. He wrote this poem in On Fairy Stories that wraps this idea up quite nicely. Although now long estranged, Man is not wholly lost, nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet is not dethroned, and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned. Man, sub-creator, the refracted light, through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues, and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world we filled with elves and goblins, though we dared to build gods and their houses out of dark and light, and sowed the seed of dragons, twas our right, used or misused, that right has not decayed, we make still by the law in which we are made. Tolkien believed that we are made in the image and likeness of God. A god who desired so greatly to create that he caused something to spring out of nothing. Of course we want to create like him, that is an incredibly potent desire that's not just going to disappear in his children. And of course, since he believed that man is in a fallen state, it would make sense that sometimes this desire was misled. Sometimes it would cause evil and danger and corruption, but there is also so much potential for 
beauty and the creator that knows themselves and who they are meant to be well enough. That's why creation, why making things, is such an important theme in The Lord of the Rings. It was the great temptation of Morgoth, the downfall of Sauron and Feanor. It's why writing, why storytelling, is the thing that brought the tale together under the loving hands of Bilbo and Frodo. It was written by someone who adores the act of creation and believed it to be one of the most fundamentally human things you can do. And while this idea is obviously very grounded in Tolkien's faith, his Catholicism, I don't think that means that it applies any less to anybody who likes to make things. You know, making anything, music, writing, visual art, a bench, a sweater, a conversation, a relationship. Do we create with the mindset of Morgoth and Sauron to own, to have something that is just ours, to possess and to control? Or do you create out of joy, for the sake of bringing more beauty into the world, for the sake of joining in the communion of the human race, for the sake of diving ever deeper into the wellspring of your own humanity? Do you create because you are human? And to be human is to create and to revel in the sharing of that creation. In Arda, the first thing that really happens is music. And it is shared music. It is collectively created music. Music sung by hundreds of voices all at once, learning how to be, learning who they are, how to love each other, finding their place in the cosmos together. Perhaps we are meant to be like them. Not creating simply to fill the void, but because creating and sharing in those creations is one of the most beautifully human experiences that there is. I've found that the world of Tolkien often resonates with creative people, people who create things, and I think that this is why. There is such a reverence towards the act of creation, and I just think it's really, really special. Let me know in the comments who your favorite maker in Middle-earth is. You can't say Iluvatar because that's cheating, and so mine is probably Bilbo, just because I really like the things he wrote, and also he didn't kill a lot of people. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it, and consider subscribing if you want to join the community to come here and chat with me every single week. Thank you so much for joining me this week, and I hope that you have a very happy hoppity day.